everyone in the room. So just getting everything uh, situated here. But thank you all for joining for this session uh, that we called together. It's not us versus them. I think this was something that came up a lot in our conversations um, with me and the Imperial Student Partners that we really want to create this space where faculty and students are working together and partnering to improve teaching and learning. And that it's not faculty versus students that students don't want to see it that way, and neither do faculty uh, and staff administration. So that's where this title came from. Um, we have, I guess we can go down the line and introduce yourself who's here in person, and then we'll let our presenters go ahead and introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Marie Gianetta. I'm a senior here at AU. <laughs> um, I'm Reba Matthews, I'm a senior. Uh, I'm Katia Sayes, and I'm a senior in the School of Education. And Kamaya and Nathaniel, if you want to unmute yourself. I'm Nathaniel Smith. I'm a junior at American. I am Kamaya Parker Hill, and I'm a senior at American. Right now, I can you unmute and speak. Uh, you're still muted. Right now, the online church. And Kimaya, can you try to do that? Sorry, what? I can't hear you. Okay, we can hear you now. We're just testing out the different sounds. So now you can introduce yourself. Okay, hi, I'm Kamaya. I'm a senior. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll go again. Hi, I'm Nathaniel. Uh, and I'm also a senior or junior, sorry, at American University. Thank you both. And then Allison Statler will be joining us via video recording because she is on a plane to study abroad right now. Um, and I'm Hannah Jardine. I'm a teaching and learning specialist at CTRL. Uh, and so I started the student partners program back in the spring of 2023. Um, so, yeah, we'll get started. While we continue to make sure all of the technology is working, uh, we have a warm up slide for you all. So, I just like to hear uh, for those of you who are in the room if you could turn and talk to the people around you and talk about what brought you to the session, what do you hope to gain from hearing student perspectives. And then, those of you who are online, we have the chat open. So, please share your thoughts in the chat what brought you to this session. Coming from far away. 
That's right. I, I don't so live like, in DC. Yeah, I live in Miami. So, um, so I'm to the cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a little colder here than it is down there, but <laughs> thank you for bringing some sunshine. To <laughs> so we've already kind of uh, played some of these out, but do want to introduce our session guidelines, and these were created collaboratively when subset of these students were in my uh, psychology of education class, actually, and then we revised them over time. Um, so just to let everybody know, each presenter will get a chance to share their project and their insights, and after each presenter, there will be time for discussion. So uh, stay tuned with your questions for those moments. And throughout the session, we agree to be respectful, honoring each other and our differences, open-minded, so inviting rather than dismissing different perspectives. We agree to be engaged, so actively participating in how it works for us, growth-oriented, seeking to learn new ideas, not just to learn. And active listeners, listening to understand, not to respond. Our outcomes for you are that by the end of this session, you'll be able to identify various challenges and barriers to equity present at AU, uh, apply specific student recommended strategies to improve your teaching, and reflect on students' perception of how to create more inclusive and effective teaching environments. So before we get to Students have to share. I just wanted to give a brief overview, and this goes to Bessie's point in the chat before, um, of what the Student Partners Program is that we started at CQRL. So essentially, um, weekly we meet with each other as CQRL staff to discuss the student experiences and perspectives. So it's a group discussion. Um, I don't know if any of you want to speak more to that, what that's like, or what are some of the topics that came up with the students. A lot of the topics that came up this semester were very rooted in what is happening on campus currently. So if there's a lot of issues that students had, that's something that we talk about within CQRL and with both each other. And we try to find ways to like amplify, enhance, and kind of like make sure that student voices are heard and are important and that it's a collaborative effort between students and faculty to create like the best way to be for students and for professors. And I would also say this month has been one of the best work environments I've been a part of. I think we can all attest to the fact that sometimes it felt like a venting session for students. Mm -hmm. And we got to hear from the professor perspective as well, again, as a professor, uh, professor here at AU. So mm -hmm. it was just interesting to be able to interact in a space where honesty was welcome. Mm -hmm. um, and we could really share our authentic experiences without any consequences in the sense of we didn't have to worry about censoring ourselves as students. We were able to like share those experiences because we know we were going to be listening to. So I really value and appreciate that. Building on that, it's uh, the chat thing is a little hard to hear, so oh. I'll be getting louder. <laughs> yeah, just building on that, I think that it's such a really healing experience to be a part of this program because oftentimes we're dealing with our classes in isolation and so we're trying to find ways um, CQRL as a larger resource that we can rely on and also get back our professors to. Um, and like we have conversations about our shared experiences and we'd like to see some like radically reimagine what education would look like for students right now. Um, I think that's a really important topic. Yeah, so that that really those are our discussions and meetings and then all the student partners also took on their own individual projects, so we kind of work um, together to brainstorm and through these conversations decide what do they want to create uh, and what do they want to make their own from this experience. So that's what they'll be here to present today is those projects based on their interests and passions and what they saw at the campus meet. Uh, I think we'll be using You could check in. Can you at least can you hear me when I? Um. So our goals for the program for that your student partners will gain professional skills, leadership experience, increase their self-efficacy, confidence, employability, develop awareness as a learner, and generate unique contributions. And that instructors, staff, and administrators will also critically reflect on these diversities of perspectives and personal experiences among students, reconceptualize learning and teaching as a process, 
and demonstrate her transform thinking about teaching and learning, which is really reiterating everything that you all have shared. So that's just that. So now we're going to get into Is this, is this the microphone system? Does this work? Yes. Okay. Max, does that, does that help when they're using the microphone? Do you have the students test it once again? <laughs> so there's a big echo with that mic. Is there an echo with this one? Uh, yeah. I think the echo is coming through Hannah's computer, so it might need to be muted while the students are speaking through the mic. I'm not sure. You have to be the two microphones next to each other. Yeah. Do that. <laughs> Good. 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 Hello. Also switch it to the MacBook mic and then we'll sit here. If you do that. There you go. It's back. It's back. Okay. How about now? So much better. Okay. This is my laptop mic, so then we'll just have to sit near the laptop when you're speaking. Oh. If that's okay. <laughs> this is the best it's been so far. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, we'll stick with this. All right, Marie is going to start us off. Okay, um, hi everybody. My name is Marie Dianetta. I'm a fifth year student here at AU. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a literature major with a concentration in creative writing and also an education studies minor. So, my project with CTRL today is about the romanticization of academic trauma and failure in higher education, specifically how we react to failure in higher education. Um, this is a topic that's super personal and important to me, and it's very much rooted in my own personal experiences, my own observations, and conversations I've had with peers, friends, faculty, family, et cetera. So please keep that in mind as I continue to talk about my projects. Um, <clears throat> okay. In 2020 and in 2021, I failed six classes here at AU, um, whether that be because of general quarantine blues or because I had really bad studying habits and homework practices. Um, I failed almost out of college and I was put on academic probation. I dropped out of school for the next semester, for an entire semester, and I really tried to center myself. When I came back to school the next semester, it was with a new profound vigor and a new determination to finally become the student that I always dreamed to be. And I worked every single day harder than I ever had in my academics, and I finally got what I wanted, which was to be a straight A student. And I finally got on Dean's List, and it was something that I never experienced before, even before in high school, when I never failed a class before. And I don't think that I would have gotten to that position before if I hadn't failed so many classes here at AU, if I hadn't experienced what failure was like. 
However, it wasn't that because I failed, I finally learned what education really meant and what it meant to learn as a student and what it meant to be a student. It was because I finally understood what the cost of failure in higher education was. It wasn't necessarily that I found a new profound love for education. I do now, now that I study it as an education studies minor. And it's probably because that I failed that I decided to take it up as a minor. But when I first came back for the semester, it was very much out of fear of failing again, because I finally understood what the cost of failing in higher education was. It cost me a lot emotionally. It cost me a lot financially. And it also cost me a lot physically sometimes. And so there's this narrative that goes around with failures that it's the best teacher, it's the best means of learning. And to an extent, I agree with that. I don't think I would be sitting here today if I hadn't failed and if I hadn't learned from my mistakes. But when we say that it's the best teacher and it's the best means of learning, there's an air of privilege to that statement. And not everyone can afford failure as a teacher. Not everyone can afford to pick themselves back up and make a name for themselves once again. And so for my project, I kind of just wanted to open this kind of conversation about failure in higher education. I still think that in some senses, failure is really helpful, maybe outside of education when it doesn't necessarily rely on costs and emotional well-being, but more so like on the person's own growth mindset. But I just wanted to open a conversation about what it means to fail as a college student and what it means and how, kind of give my own perspective as someone who has failed many classes here at AU and as somebody who quote unquote is now a better student, whatever we may just like say is a better student at this point. Um, so that's basically my project. It's a podcast. It's kind of just like all my thoughts about failure in higher education. And like, it's a very complicated and I kind of just wanted to be like a conversation starter. I don't think that I have a lot of answers, but I just wanted to have some questions that maybe we can ask ourselves as like future educators and also as educator educators currently. Um, let me go to the next slide. Oh, gosh, how do I go to the next? Oh, is it already? Okay, cool. Um, so to start, I think that one of the things that I hope educators can take away from my project and perhaps implement in classroom settings is just like having this thought in the back of your head when we tell students that. Failure is not something to be feared. It's something to be encouraged because this is what, me what it means to really learn when we make ourselves vulnerable and put it out there. Um, I kind of want people to understand like what are we really asking of our students when we say that to them. Um, as someone who's heard this many times after I failed many classes and they were very much like, look at you now, you learned so much. And I, and I kind of was like, yes, but at what cost? Like how, why did I have to learn this much at the cost of more loans and then my emotional well-being, my lack of confidence, trying to build myself back up and almost like hating myself in the beginning just so I can be a straight A student once more and kind of make my academics worth it. Because if I wasn't a straight A student, I couldn't understand like why school would be worth it at that point. So that's just something that one of the things that I hope educators can take away if they listen to my project. And um, if you have any questions, so no. Okay. My name's Alyssa, I'm a career advisor, and I work with CAS students. I was a literature major myself, so I'm oh. excited. <laughs> yeah, literature! <laughs> I'm not biased towards any particular major, but I'm yeah, very excited about this when I interact with literature majors. And I like to also showcase, like, a, you know, sort of an, an, a, uh, a, an example, an embodiment of a career pathway into something that Made you know it's a, a wandering path into career advising that started uh, from literature. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a long time yoga practitioner, and uh, when you said centered and getting centered and grounded, what were some techniques that you utilized that semester when you took time to to reset? And what do you still carry with you in terms of self care practices or mindset things that you like work on? So I'm incredibly family oriented. Maybe it's like a culture thing and like stuff like that, but I'm very family oriented. And so I went home and spent time with my parents. And um, this might not be the answer for everyone, but I went to church and I'm pretty religious. So I started praying more. And then I also took time to like focus on my physical well-being. 
hopefully. Um, and I would start going on walks, trying to like exercise my mind in like different ways that aren't necessarily academic, but more so like in a creative field. So I started also like painting more, started going out more, tried doing hikes and rock climbing because it like utilized my brain in a different way than I had for like the past four years. So that was one of the ways that I, I try to center myself again. That was my oh, really? Okay, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> answer that question um what's one book or article that you read about trauma or failure that you'd recommend faculty or staff to read oh this is a difficult question I believe how students learn is one of the things they kind of talked about failure um I forgot his name yeah. um, Josh, Eiler? Josh Eiler yeah he wrote a chapter on failure in students and I think that it's super helpful um he kind of talks about more like low stakes failure rather than high stakes failure I'm kind of necessarily talking about high stakes failure when there's not really much that you can come back from. Um, but he kind of like discusses that. And I think that if you're learning, want to learn more about failure, um, how students learn by Josh Weiler, it's really helpful. Oh, yeah. someone, someone put it in. Okay. How humans learn. And I may have to move on since we okay. had all these <laughs> times. Uh, thank you for sharing your, your story and your experience. Uh, I'm curious if you could, uh, a lot of those faculty members work with students when they're in the mm. experience of failure is very stressful. I think the world is ending. Yeah. Um, like, is there any advice you can give us when we're working with students that had a small bit of time? Mm -hmm. That we can help them work through it. I mean, you are a success story. Uh, I, it's very rare to, for, for my perspective, mm. hear a student that's so bad that we have a student that we have. And so I think it's really scary. And so if you have any advice for us, that would be that you I think that handling students with a lot of empathy, like radical empathy is really helpful. Um, I had one professor, I was on the verge of failing one of her classes and I ended up not. She was one of the professor, one of the classes that I didn't fail those like terrible, terrible years. And it's because like she showed me a lot of radical empathy with my with my like academic performance. And she gave me a lot of like parameters and like we made a whole schedule together. And it's very one on one with the professor and like really communicating. Um, I think like making sure that the students know that even if they seem like they're in a bad place that the world is ending, if they can just communicate that with you guys, that'll be like the best thing. Like it doesn't like there shouldn't be any shame. Like students shouldn't feel shame about where the, where their positions are at. They just need to communicate that. And that already is like the next step in becoming like a better student and trying to get yourself out there and also centering like what your purpose is for education. Like trying to find the purpose of why you're here and what you really wanna do. I think that's also another really helpful thing. For students. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Marie, but you are. Hmm. Okay. Hello, my name is Reba Matthews. That's R E B A. M-A-T-H-E-W-S, and I use she, her pronouns. I am a brown 20-year-old woman. I have short black hair, and I'm wearing a dark green sweater with dark blue jeans and a neon green scarf around my neck. I'm also wearing white high tops with black lines, and I'm also wearing a name tag. If you scan the QR code with your phone in the bottom left corner of the slide, you will be directed to the access copy of my presentation or the script for my presentation. And feel free to follow along if you'd like. A quick description of what an access copy is. It's basically a script of my presentation and in a more formal setting, it would be a script that I would follow completely. So I wouldn't do what I'm doing right now. I wouldn't be talking and explaining this. Um, so if I do ad libs here and there, please forgive me, but just wanted to include this because it is just one of the examples of how to institute accessible policies that I was able to learn in the class I took here at AU. Um, hyperlinked at the top of that script is my project, which you can also look through. Um, still, there are so many other ways uh, to make this project and presentation even more accessible. Um, this project is a zine I wrote to call attention to how disability and accessibility practices are implemented and experienced at AU. This subject was inspired by my American studies class, Disability, Health, and Normality, and my interest in disability advocacy in higher education. 
because many people face structural barriers that prevent them from receiving official acknowledgement for their disability status and identity, I decided to not simply rely on the label disabled. It would be hypocritical of me not to acknowledge that you should not be put in the position to prove your disability or why your situation constitutes deservingness of accommodations. This is, however, the reality of higher education system, calling us to question what dictates the standards and limitations of accessibility at universities. Accessibility, in my opinion, ought to be seen as the standard classroom procedure. In as much as it concerns the moral recognition and required inclusion of individuals and their burdensome conditions. Such situations have been suitably deemed as a hindrance to performance and production that does not benefit um, the profits to be made by the corporate higher education institution. As students and faculty, we are forced to work through such discriminatory and harmful policies, which in turn encourage us to invalidate and disregard one another's lived learning experiences. This zine critiques such um, environments and de delves into the hidden curriculum that has enabled such ableist praxis. Um, so just to get to the next slide, which is the Q&A slide, um, the question to start off with is how can we collaborate as students and faculty to ensure an accessible classroom culture? And I just wanna give a shout out to Kamai who will be presenting later on um, in the presentation. Last semester, we did a project together where we coined the term or we came up with the term collective accountability. And it basically, Kamai will speak more about it, but in regards to how it applies to an accessible classroom culture, it's communication. Um, one of the goals of the institution and uh, how it keeps people separate and how it, uh, it encourages you to invalidate your own lived experiences is you, there's no encouraged communication. It's a lot of things of being pressured not to communicate with your professor about accommodations you may need. It's very difficult for students to advocate for themselves. It is not something that is taught to you. You have to learn how to do self-advocacy. And even in the face of that, you may be um, dealing with a professor who is not as understanding. And so if we want to collaborate as students and faculty to accomplish such an accessible classroom culture, I encourage us to listen to one another because faculty is also affected by this. Um, as I'm sure you all know, as educators or as people involved in education, there's additional labor you have to do. There may be um, administrations and administrators that have not acknowledged the accessibility and accommodation met needs that you have that have not been met. And you deserve to have those things um, accomplished and required. And I do a shout out to some organizations and literature in the zine if you wanna check that out. We have the Disability Plus um, organization for faculty here at AU. It's a great disability rights um, uh, organization that you can refer to. And there's also this Disabled Student Union here at AU as well. And I'm a part of that and they're doing great work. So any other questions I'm open to? And yeah, or I can just keep talking. <laughs> I think we have time for one question. Yeah, yeah May. Are you yes, are you an AUX professor? Okay, perfect. Um to any AUX professors here, I will also say that AUX is very notorious <laughs> at AU. I think you can talk to every student because it's a class that all students are required to take um, here at AU. So I've heard many um, varying opinions, but also shared opinions about AUX. I think it is definitely the place to begin discussing these things. I would say that hmm, <laughs> it's, it's very difficult to teach students how to advocate for themselves um, because every situation is obviously unique. No two students are the same just how no two faculty members are the same. Uh, but I think AUX could really provide a place like CTRL provides for us for students to be able to talk about their experiences, feel that they're at least being heard by some part of the university. I think it's a great place for that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Come 
Maya is next. Can you guys hear me? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, we can. Okay. Should I start? Tell me when to start. Yeah, you can start. Okay. Um, this semester, I decided to um, extend off of our collaborative project that I worked with um, with Reba last year. And so last year, we focused on, on student educator dynamics. And one of the things that we said would support these dynamics is collective accountability. This collective accountability, I basically alleviates the ideology that the accountability of teaching and learning falls on the role of an educator. So it basically allows us to um, have that, oh, sorry guys, um, to not only give educators like that burden of learning because it is hard as an educator. And so I wanted as a student to understand where we're coming from as students because it is easy to be like, well, this professor isn't understanding me, but if we don't understand what we need and what we're asking for, then it's just going to create more frustration. And so with collective accountability, our extending from collective accountability, I wanted to look more into how the um, students or what students really need. And I found that students seek support and flexibility from educators. Um, with my research, I sent out a survey to both students and faculty. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get much from faculty, but I did um, get information from one professor who really stood out to me and was able to or shared that burnout is something that we can't push through. And that was kind of the first time I ever heard from a professor specifically that burnout isn't something that we just push through. We need to learn how to prevent and to um, work through it rather than just saying that burnout something that everyone experiences. And so we really need to make an indication or make an emphasis on how this effect of burnout is on both educators and students. And yeah, I don't know. That's right. kind of all. Yeah. So maybe we'll start you with a question, maybe similar to um, Marie's question. So what would, from your work and your project, what is one thing you would want educators to know or to apply? Um, I think being flexible, not only in the classroom, but in the curriculum, I think something or in a specific event that happened was when I came in to, on the first day of uh, education class, we were presented our syllabus, but with edits to be made. And so our professor allowed us to go over the syllabus and kind of think about as a class what we would be able to accomplish for the year. And with that information, we were able to um, create a syllabus that not only the professor was okay with allowing us to have, but for us to also be okay with as students. So I think just being flexible. Yeah, flexible, responsive. Um, are there any questions in the chat or does anybody here have a question for Kamaya? don't see any questions. Well, thank you, Kamaya, for sharing. We'll clap for you in person. You. I don't know if you've been here. Thank right. you. 
Yeah, could see how you're up. Hi, everyone. <laughs> no, you're good. Where's the... Hi everyone, my name is Katsia and I am a it's senior. Real loud okay. <laughs> Should I not in the mic, right? It's fine. Okay. I'm sorry, I tend to be a little bit quiet. Um, um my name is Katsia and I am a senior in the School of Education, finishing up my last semester. I'm majoring in elementary education and minoring in Arab world studies. Um, I'm a first generation student of color, um, and my project is informed by my experiences in higher education, and especially at American University. Um, a predominantly white institution, um, a fact that we cannot deny even under the umbrella terms that we employ, such as inclusive excellence. Um, American University, similar to other higher education institutions, um, at the end of the day favors perspectives that aligns with whiteness, thereby marginalizing minority viewpoints. And this bias is not restricted to the classroom, but also reflects um, a more significant problem that we have on campus in terms of the weaponization of truth and knowledge and what we validate as not like acceptable. Um, in many academic settings, the normative truth is implicitly safeguarded, leading to a skewed representation of history, culture, and knowledge. And this approach suppresses diverse experiences, um, including and especially experiences of students of color um, while maintaining power structures that are detrimental to an inclusive learning environment that we all are here and aiming to strive for. Um, and I argue that by acknowledging and valuing the diversity of our unique human experiences um, and knowledge is essential to dismantling what I call academic violence um, and cultivating what I term um, academic safety in our classrooms and across the university. Um, my personal journey um, leads me to this discussion today. Um, and I'll define academic violence as not just the overt um, direct forms of violence and discrimination and hostility and bias and prejudice um, that we are um, able to name more directly, but also the subtle manifestations um, that show up through biased curriculum and our teaching methods that we will employ in the classroom um, that overlook some of the diverse experiences that students are coming in with. Um, and I offer some strategies in my um, project to help counter academic violence. And some of those include a more comprehensive curriculum review and something that's more of an ongoing process that some of my peers also touch on. Um, so having those conversations with students in terms of what your curricula look like and syllabus look like um, and allowing, allowing for those diverse perspectives. Um, so this doesn't just mean that you have that one section on uh, where you'll include like um, scholars of color or that one section in the curriculum, but also try to do that more across the board so it's not just that like lumped in um, because those like those experiences while shared but also are unique and diverse. Um, employing diverse um, and inclusive teaching methodologies that cater to different approaches to learning and backgrounds, um, understanding where your students are coming from, um, and also willing to do professional development as educators um, and this is a great place to start with CTRL um, and empowering student voices in the classroom um, and creating ways for students to um, advocate for themselves in the classroom. I, I argue this because I think that um, you have to find a delicate balance between challenging your students and striving for that rigor that we all try to do um, in higher education, but also making sure that that doesn't overstep into a boundary of violence because it can show up in that way, um, especially if there are other things happening in the world that are impacting students. Um, I think that striving for that balance between academic ch challenge and um, psychological safety in the classroom is critical um, because if you do one and not the other, um, you're allowing for um, that maintenance of power that is implicit in our structures. Um, I think that ensuring academic safety involves being mindful of um, some of the larger dynamics around campus and some of the ways that students may be experiencing those and coming to the classroom with because, um, and this can include physical safety on campus, um, just safety measures, 
specifically, but also just how students are experiencing safety around campus, um, psychological safety in the learning environment, again, the curriculum, intellectual safety and freedom. Um, this applies to students and faculty. So allowing for students to explore controversial topics or what um, higher education may deem controversial topics um, through an open and respectful um, conversation with them and understanding why they might be wanting to pursue those topics, but also respecting um, your peers and faculty who are pursuing those topics and encouraging that because higher education is a space to do that. Um, and then offering safe um, mechanisms for students to hold each other accountable, also hold you accountable and vice versa, like collective accountability that Kamaya talked about. Um, I think that I understand higher education and American University to be a space where um, professors are able to bridge that gap between theory and practice. We often see academia as a separation from society, but um, I don't, I think that if we're trying to strive for um, like creating students who are change makers and we are, we also have to be open to having those conversations with students. So when those conversations come up, centering students in those conversations and centering student voices in those conversations is important. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about that, but I think that rooting your conversations in trauma-based, um, trauma-informed learning is really critical. Um, and yeah, just approaching it with trauma-informed um, teaching, being willing to improve your instruction based on feedback, um, ensuring that students feel safe, um, so we can allow for a more inclusive, supportive, enriching um, learning environment for all students in our classroom. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Yeah. Well, what's an example of trauma-informed instruction that's like a takeaway that we could all yeah. care about this? I think something that Hannah started the presentation off with with the shared guidelines is really important. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that I really value when professors do and do meaningfully and well. Um, I've also seen professors try to do that and not to do it successfully. And it feels like um, just like a, it feels like it needs to be done meaningfully and intentionally for it to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, so really that. And then I think um, trust is really important in trauma-informed teaching. I think that you have to be willing to trust your professor to have those conversations and professors willing to establish that trust with students and then um, creating a classroom environment where there may be disagreements where we can all trust each other to respect each other's perspectives. Maybe a follow-up is how do you create that trust? Yeah. What does that look like? <laughs> um, I think that work have, like is something that you, it's really difficult to do. Um, I can only speak from my perspective as a student and working in K-12 education, but I think that you like you have to be willing to be uncomfortable um, and that discomfort, allowing that discomfort to really lead you into learning. Um, I think that just trusting each other to be open um, to like being discomfortable um, allowing us to challenge each other in a way that is um, also ensuring that we're all respecting each other. I, I, it's a delicate balance. Any other questions? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Right, Nate. Everyone can hear me, right? I just want to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Nathaniel Smith. Um, I am a double major in history and secondary education with a minor in literature. Um, and I'll be presenting today on what I have called uh, kind of shifting the role um, of a professor and creating more cognitive comprehension. Um, to begin, 
I want to also drop in the chat. Um, this is the link to the projects, uh, my project that I created. Um, and one question I had kind of that kept um, coming up in my mind as I was thinking about coming up with a project was what is the best format and balance um, of a class where students learn both in the classroom and outside of the classroom. I think a lot of information, um, depending on a student's learning style and how they comprehend and take in information, is either primarily in class or um, always out of class. Um, so there's kind of this, this balance in between of like, which is better. I think professors sometimes think, should I spend more time focusing on all in-class material or less time on all out-of-class material? And that obviously depends on the student. But um, the two points I want to talk about today are multimedia uh, education and this idea of a flipped classroom model. Now, some of you might um, be aware of what multimedia education is, but if not, um, it essentially is utilizing tools, meaning recording class lectures, um, teaching through uh, different modes um, in different media forms like videos, podcasts, um, and kind of getting away from a traditional mindset of the only way to consume and take in information is through scholarly articles or um, books. Um, not to say you can't use those, but we know as educators that students learn differently in different modes. So we might as well teach through those modes. Um, and this kind of creates an environment where all types of learners can comprehend information at their own rate by having multiple media forms utilized in a syllabus, utilized in the classroom, outside of the classroom. It creates this balance of, okay, I know I can learn the same way I do outside of the classroom when I come into the classroom. And I'm not just sitting there, maybe watching a presentation and listening. I can engage and learn through different modes. Um, and so that brings me to my second point, which is the flipped classroom model, which aims to primarily expose students outside of the classroom so that when they come into the classroom, it's utilized more as a time to engage with the material, um, have discussions, have collaborations, have various ways students can wrap their head and truly ask questions about what they're trying to learn and truly comprehend, not just maybe say learn for a test and get a grade. Um, I interviewed a number of students and professors, and I think the biggest thing that um, I learned from doing this and creating this project is utilizing these multiple modes and informing students primarily um, before they come into class means that that process of learning can happen um, at a student's own rate. And they can, I mean, say with a video or if you record any lectures, they can pause it and go back and take notes on what they missed. And now a lot of what was brought up when I would interview professors would say, well, if I do this, how do I know a student is going to utilize it or this might seem like a lot of work um, to ensure that maybe only 50% of my class will use it. Um, and to that, I would say it is more work. But if you can create a class where a student leaves with actual knowledge that they're going to then go on and use um, in a later class, in a job, in an internship, I think that's a lot better. Um, and so... Probably my biggest takeaway for this presentation and for professors, educators, um, staff is that um, utilizing and having these multiple modes, which we know students learn from, integrating that into the syllabus and saying, hey, we're going to simply provide students with different ways of learning and not limiting it to one way. Um, therefore, that an overall comprehension and true retention of information is achieved um, in and outside of the classroom. Um, and so now I will open it up to any questions. 
um, feel free to type them in the chat or those who are in person. Uh, yeah, Mr. Nathaniel, uh, I'm just curious, did you experience good examples uh, in, in your AD career of uh, a professor really leveraging uh, multimodal learning, flipping the classroom, you know, using Canvas, things of that nature. Do you have like good examples of that, or are you more proposing this is what? Yeah. Um. So I have I have a mixture of both. It's not it's not all of one. It's not all of the other. Um. I've definitely like any student who goes through any university has better classes than others, and that also should be noted that that is probably more of a reflection of like my learning style also and like their teaching style. Sometimes they don't mix, but one class that I really enjoyed was um, one that I had in the history department. Um, and then I'll share another one in uh, the education department, um, which was this professor during COVID um, chose to record all of his lectures on a podcast and and really integrate um, this podcast format into um, his teaching. And so he he knew that his history class was very dense in information. Um, and so he said, I'm going to, you know, record this podcast, I'm going to send it to you, you can listen to it at any time. And then the in class time is essentially going over that incredibly in depth podcast. And then um, highlighting the obviously the key points and everything, but also saying uh, there is at least always 20 minutes, I think, in the class of where students could ask questions, highlight points that they brought up, and really kind of engage in this discussion. And that also creates more of a bond with your professor, as well as um, your classmates on what you're trying to create. And then just in the education department, um, I had a professor who chose to really um, teach through all types of mode modes. Um, obviously, we had we had a textbook that we were learning from, but um, almost every class that we learned from, uh, there was at least a video, a recording um, of a current uh, professor in the field of topic we're researching um, that we would listen to, and then there would be a collaborative discussion about it um, and a note taking process that we would take through. Um, so yeah, those are just two examples, but if there's any other questions. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Nathaniel. So we do have, um, like I said, one more student partner. Um, who's not able to be here with us because she is traveling to study abroad, but she did put together the slide. So I'll just kind of talk through her project really quickly. She did put together a video, but I'm noting the time and um, so we'll, we'll talk through that and then we can answer questions and open it up to just general questions for us. Um, but Ali Sattler is really focused on STEM inclusivity. So last semester, she did a project thinking about what is a inclusive classroom or inclusive STEM classroom look like in terms of the teaching practices. And then this semester thought more about the curricula. So um, really dug into the history of STEM education. And you can read this in her project. Um, questioned if we are teaching the right thing. So in particular, she's a um, education at math double major and just noticing drastic differences between her education courses and her math courses and the way they're taught, um, but had a really awesome uh, math class this semester where the professor did a project um, and asked them to do kind of uh, dig into the history of an underrepresented mathematician. And then she kind of questioned like, why don't we do this more in math classes? Why are we just like learning the math and not learning about who does the math or who is and isn't represented in the textbook? So that led to her project. And then she created, especially for those of you who are in STEM, I know Meg is, I'm not sure if anybody else is, um, she created a syllabus template with lots of annotations for how you can do different parts of your syllabus to be more inclusive um, and accessible in a STEM course. Um, so I will I'll also share um, when I do the follow up with her. Um, I mean, follow up with you all, share her video with you all. So 
unfortunately, Allie couldn't be here, but please check out her resource. Um, yeah, so I also wanted to just leave some time at the end of the session. They get to share about their projects and you ask questions about their projects. But if you have any questions in general for the students about the student experience, about the upcoming semester, um, about their work as a CTRL student partner, any anything. And um, in the chat, I'll be looking for any questions there too. Yeah, Amanda. <laughs> These are just awesome presentations that can be really, like, really, really rich and powerful. Thank you. Um, my question for you is um, many of your education majors are having first education experience. What do you take away? Right, not a good yeah, I think we're actually all education is no. not minors and yeah, yeah. And as well. So for me, um especially because I, I teach now. Um I'm a dance teacher, I've taught K through twelve and I've been a mentor for like uh college students and peers here as well. So I feel that something I've learned is empathy for my instructors as well. Uh, I think through <laughs> I think through um my work and like being in the classroom and getting uh experience from that perspective, it has allowed me to understand that as professors, like students, you also have to censor a lot of your emotions, a lot of your experiences. And I think higher education has really it's it's not encouraged, but it is the place to be honest. You are allowed to share with your students and going back to Question Katsia was asked about how do you build that trust? It is through that, through these honest conversations. It is through like sharing with your students, hey, I'm having a so-and-so day or asking students how their day is going. Even if it's just two minutes in the beginning of the class, that is how you build trust. It's showing an actual investment in your students. And I think education and rigor, those two can go hand in hand, but empathy also has its place in all those things. So. I think that's something that we forget about, especially in the college setting, but that's something that I've learned. And anybody else can answer that same question? Or... Yeah, um, last semester I was doing my practicum teaching at Horace Mann. And so I think like just like find like having that experience of being a teacher and also being a student at the same time um was a lot of like I was taking all these theory heavy classes and then I was in my practical setting and applying theory to practice something I talked about in my project as well like doing that at the same time and understanding like the limitations and also just like how to overcome those limitations as well was really important because obviously you're going to have those administrative challenges um so I think that's something that I've learned to understand the nuances of better um, and un appreciate more the application of what we're learning or talking about in how we're showing up and the actions around like that we have with us. Yeah. I just I just uh, maybe more of an observation. I was struck by the use of clinical terms like psychological safety, like trauma, like violence, well violence means and I really have a psychology professor over here. And I'm just curious about like kind of the implications of, of applying those types of terms to a higher education classroom curriculum. I'm not talking about like say like violence that happens in like a, a physical violence that may happen like in a residential Say, I'm not talking about that per se, but like in a classic environment. Yeah. I'm just kind of mulling all that. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. yeah. I guess I'm feeling, I guess what I'm noticing, I'm feeling like, I'm just noticing my own discomfort around yeah. something well enough. Yeah. Um, during freshman year, which was during COVID, I remember like a conversation I had in AUX where I was just like, we were just talking about like how we're doing and like just our learning environments and stuff. Um, and I was like, 
I said something along the lines of we can't learn if we're not okay and I feel like that really applies and everyone was like struck by it and I was like this just feels like a really fundamental thing if you're not okay you can't learn um and you could be getting perfect grades and still not be okay um so I think that just kind of like understanding and being empathetic towards that and like mental health and that psychological safety and violence is like not like not just the 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 physical violence that we can identify and name but it, it's, it's like every like we're all so different and we all are experiencing a lot of the things that are happening around us differently um and that's from a student perspective and professors are experiencing it differently so just kind of coming together and creating that space to find that shared experience so. um if i can add to that i would also say uh, learning from Katia's project and just like reading through her guide, which I would strongly encourage, it's very well written. Um, I think when you say like clinical terms, like that strikes me as well, because that's a lot of pressure on professors and faculty to be responsible for psychological safety, for physical safety of your students. And especially in like the political climate we have today and how education and how this like classrooms are not a safe space. And like we all know that in this country, it has not been, it's, it is not. Um, that's a lot of pressure to put on professors and we give you that understanding as well as students that it's a lot of pressure on you and you're not trained in psychology you're not required professors are not required to even like have too much like the same degree of educational training the same degree of like psychological psych training in psychology so I think something that helps is understanding you're going to make a mistake mm -hmm. how to bounce back from that state mistake understanding students do not owe you forgiveness um, you can ask for forgiveness, but you're not, students are not required to give you any feedback back on that. That is not their job. Um, and in respect to that, encouraging you all to continue to learn more about what academic safety can mean in the classroom, as well as um, understanding that as professors, like you are entitled to that same psychological mm -hmm. and emotional safety. And that even though this is your career, you should be in the position to be able to advocate for yourselves. and. Mm -hmm. Be able to claim that because the classroom is an unsafe and uncomfortable place for us all but i think as kamaya and like all of our projects kind of talk about it takes a collaborative effort to kind of work towards academic safety so the understanding that it's going to be uncomfortable yeah. <laughs> i just have a follow-up question and i i think about our threat of the, the not okay and like the problem or i'm struggling or i'm challenged by an idea how can we help students to recognize when there's a trauma response yeah. or a lack of safety versus this is a, an idea that I disagree with or I feel mm. uh, is tough for me or I'm threatened by it, but there's like growth or resiliency <laughs> in pushing like through that or, or grappling with it. Like what, what would you say as a student? Help you to differentiate. Yeah, I think in regards to, I would say maybe the, I'm going to speak towards the professor perspective of that, understanding your own positionality mm -hmm. in the sense that we cannot really dictate how a student is going to react to something. We cannot judge their responses to things because we don't know if it's going to be textbook definition of what a trauma um, response is. We don't know if it's something that someone may simply disagree with. Um, so understanding and also validating that student's response to something is really important and remembering, okay, I'm a professor, but I'm also an in individual that may have a different experience from this student. Is it my place to really classify what this student may be experiencing, how they should respond to that? Um, and then I think Katia can speak more to that question. Yeah, just building off of that, I think that leading with humility is really important. Like we are, students are here obviously to learn, professors are here to teach, but I think all of us in the, like we can create a collective learning environment where we're all learning and willing to learn um, instead of having a classroom environment that's very much like a power imbalance between the professor and the student. Um, like we're all going to make mistakes. We're all going, we're all imperfect. Um, but I think that just willingness to learn is the first and most critical step. Um, but also like I've had multiple instances where I don't feel like going to a professor because my grade's at stake or something like that. Like I feel like those power imbalances are always going to be there. So um, 
navigating them instead of like dismissing them is really important as well. Like understanding positionality as a professor, um, as a person who's in a position of power, in a position to teach and like employ that teaching in some way. Um, I think it's important. Okay. Any other Are there any questions from the online group? No, I think, I mean, are there other questions? Yes, I'll just, I'll put up our thank you slide, but thank you so much for being here, both the online audience and in person, thank you, especially to Nate and Kamaya online and to Kutsia, Reba, and Marie. Um, thank you all are sticking around for lunch, possibly. So maybe you can chat with them at the tables or feel free to stick around and continue the conversation. Um, and please take a look at their written work. Um, it's up on their website. So, well, and Marie's podcast, audio work. Thank <laughs> so you. For, thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your winter break to be with us. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>